this is probably a sad commentary on the state of higher education in the United States. <laughs> but nothing I've ever done in my scientific career has gained as much credibility with my students as being <laughs> um, the, For those of you who, who d didn't quite understand the reference, Bill O'Reilly is a very widely viewed, very conservative talk show host who runs a program very much like the one that this is parroting. And the host, Stephen Colbert, professes to look up and admire uh, Mr. <laughs> O'Reilly. So therefore, when I said gave rise to you and me and even Bill O'Reilly, um, that the audience just went nuts because that's a frequent reference on this show. So in any event, I showed that, first of all, for entertainment value. But secondly, um, to, to let you see how even a very casual conversation, this certainly was casual, turns to that essential issue about evolution. What about God? And he came up with this issue right away. And that, I think, is the substance for many people of their objections to evolution. And it's a fact that there is no shortage of anti-evolution, anti-religious statements that have been made by scientists. So, for example, David Hull, writing in the journal Nature several years ago, wrote this. Whatever the God implied by evolutionary theory and the data of natural history may be like, he is not the Protestant God of waste not want not. He's not a loving God who cares about his productions. He isn't even the awful God portrayed in the book of Job. The God of the Galapagos, that's the God of evolution, is careless, wasteful, indifferent, almost diabolical. He certainly is not the sort of God to whom anyone would be inclined to pray. In short, God, if he exists, is a thoroughly nasty fellow. And that, presumably, is the message of evolutionary biology. Quite famously, Richard Dawkins has written, and he liked this phrase so much he put it in two of his books. Um, he, it, 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 he said that the universe we know about through evolution, the, the Darwinian universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And every time I read that quotation, I'm amazed because I know of no one who leads their life with a greater intensity of purpose than Richard Dawkins. Um, although Richard, to be fair, would say he didn't say that he had no purpose, he said the universe had no purpose. And I have suggested back to Richard that perhaps the purpose of the universe was to bring Richard Dawkins into existence. But we can debate that at a later time, presumably when the bar is open. Now, Dawkins has most recently, as you know, sharpened these criticisms of religion in his best-selling, and in the U.S. at least, it has been near the top of the best-seller list, his best-selling book, The God Delusion, um, I think a more subtle and sophisticated attack on religion was written by Daniel Dennett, my countryman, who is a professor of philosophy at Tufts University, and most recently Christopher Hitchens, of course, has gotten into the fray as well. So we have seen an explosion of this sort of book arguing not only, as Hitchens does, that religion ruins everything, but also that evolutionary biology pretty much does away with any need to examine the concept of God as a theological or a scientific possibility. Now, the assertions that all of these books have written underneath them is very clear. And that assertion is that science alone can lead us to truth regarding the purpose of existence. And of course, where it leads us is the assertion that existence does not have a purpose. And that presumably is something we can learn from science, that existence does not have a purpose. The reality is that statements like this are philosophical and not scientific in nature. Now, philosophical, I, you might think, what does a science think of philosophy? If a scientist, an experimental scientist, think of philosophy? The usual answer is not much. Um, but in this particular context, when I say it's a philosophical statement, I don't mean it's wrong. I simply mean it is not testable by the methods of science. Um, and therefore, a statement like these that you saw preceding actually has no more scientific standing than a faith-based assertion on the nature of existence that I or some other scientist who is a person of faith might make. Now, that doesn't mean that we're right and Dawkins is wrong or vice versa. It simply means that when he makes those arguments and when Dennett makes those arguments, they're not arguing scientifically. They are arguing philosophically. And that's a very important point in preserving the, what I would call the, 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 ide the ideology-free character of experimental science itself. Now, most recently, 
Um, and you've already heard uh, me say on the screen what my faith is. Um, when Pope Benedict um, was, uh, was, uh, was giving his coronation homily in Rome a couple of years ago, um, this was a remark that he made. And this was widely reported in press around the world. Uh, from my own mediocre German, um, I translated this in a pretty straightforward way. Um, and that is, the Pope said that we are not the casual and pointless products of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved. Each of us is necessary. When the intelligent design movement in the United States heard that, believe me, their blogs fired up. And they said, at last we have a Pope who was going to embrace intelligent design. And they anticipated that Benedict would ultimately turn out to be a powerful ally. Um, when I looked at that statement, I thought the statement's most important line is not that we are not the products of evolution. It doesn't say that. It says we are not the casual and pointless products of evolution. And that is the key. And I'll come back to this a little bit later. Because obviously the leader of the world's largest Christian denomination, his views on evolution are, are really quite influential, not just within this faith, but within other faiths as well. Now, there's a key observation in this, and the more that I read Pope Benedict's statements about this, the more I became aware that this is part of what bothers people about evolution. The claim that evolution is, as you often hear, a chance, random process, is really at the heart of objections to what people label as Darwinism. If you and I are just the results of a roll of the dice, what does that mean about the significance of our uh, existence? And uh, only about two years ago, a United States senator, a very conservative Republican senator and also a fellow Catholic <laughs> named Rick Santorum, put this into words that I think are very apt and very well stated. So I'm going to play a clip from Senator Santorum appearing on radio in the United States. He had written a book called It Takes a Family, Conservatism and the Common Good, articulating his political philosophy. And one of the reasons he did this is because when this was originally aired in 2005, Santorum was anticipating a possible run for President of the United States. The voters in Pennsylvania, unfortunately for Senator Santorum, took care of that in November 2006 because they voted him out of office. And an unsuccessful senator is never going to have a chance to run for president, so that was the end of that. But his comments here, I thought, were right on the mark. So what I'd like to do is to play them for you. These are very brief. Why, why does that particular item of the academic curriculum concern you as a, as a United States it's senator? Why do those hold the item is evolution. consequences for society? I mean, it's, it's where we come from. Does man have a purpose? Uh, is there a purpose for our lives, or are we just simply you know, the result of, uh, of chance. Uh, if we're the result of chance, if we're simply a mistake of nature, then that puts a different moral demand on us. In fact, it doesn't put a moral demand on us than if, in fact, we are a creation of a being that has moral demands. And I listened to that and I thought, that's it. That's absolutely at the heart. Senator Santorum is a profoundly moral guy. What I mean by that is he art openly articulates a moral philosophy and uses it to guide his political philosophy. And as I explained to students in the United States, morality is much more than just don't do sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Morality is what is the just society? How should one treat the poor? When should one go to war? What is the appropriate way to aid underdeveloped countries? These are all moral questions. And what Santorum is saying here is that if we are the result of Darwinian processes, which he describes as chance, then there are no moral demands on us. And what that means is not only that we're free to go out and party and drink and do everything we want, but it also means that the very notions of good and evil, right and wrong, are illusions. And for someone who had organized their entire life around a particular moral viewpoint, the notion that the very concept of good and evil is invalidated if Darwin was right, is a profoundly threatening concept. And I thank Senator Santora for putting that objection so straightforwardly, because I think it's at the heart of objections to evolution. Now let's go back to our friend Richard Dawkins' statement about the Darwinian universe. And again, that's exactly what he believes, and that's exactly what he says. But is that indeed a scientific statement? And when Dawkins says it, he wraps it in a context that makes it sound scientific. But let's suppose I was to look at... Uh, 
uh, the thoughts of some other scientists. Um, in particular, uh, people like Francisco Ayala, a very famous population geneticist, Theodosio Dobzhansky, one of the great figures in 20th century evolutionary biology, Francis Collins, the head of the Human Genome Project, or John Haught, who to be fair is not a scientist but a theologian at Georgetown University in the United States. And let's suppose I decided I would put words in their mouth. And I've actually shown these words to two of them, and they said, yes, I, I'd be happy to say that. Um, and asked them, look at the universe the way Richard Dawkins is. What would you say? And the words that I would put in their mouth are these. And that is that the Darwinian universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom the design of a provident and purposeful God intent upon a fruitful and dynamic world, because that's the one we have, and committed to a promise of freedom, which we also have, that makes genuine love possible. Now, I believe that. That's not a scientific statement, but neither is Dawkins. And that is the key to understand these alternate ways of looking at the world that we see through science. Now, let me put this a little bit further. Let's suppose we start out on our planet, and we look, for example, uh, 560 million years into the past to the animals of the Cambrian. And you see some of them here. And these, incidentally, and I hope all of you recognize his stature, these were uh, many of, a couple of them discovered, most of them reinterpreted and reclassified by Simon Conway Morris, who is really one of the preeminent paleontologists in the world and did fundamental work about 20 years ago on the Burgess Shale, continues to do groundbreaking paleontology. If we now spin the clock forward 560 million years, what do we get? Well, we get a planet on which we have other organisms appearing. And these organisms appear in a pattern that actually allows us to trace our own ancestry to them. The fossil record of human evolution, especially in the last quarter century, has become astonishingly complete. The notion that there is some unbridgeable gap between ourselves and our pre-human ancestors is simply wrong. And when we simply lay out the specimens and the times in which they live, what we see is that the confusion among human paleontologists is not, um, is there a pre-human ancestor we can link ourselves to, but rather, which of these is our great-grandfather and which of this is our second cousin and our fourth uncle and our crazy aunt up in the, in the, in the attic and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. But there's a very close and atypical bushy evolutionary tree that describes the emergence of our own species. So all of this has happened on our planet. And these records, these dates, these times, and these skulls are factual. Um, how we connect the dots is interpretation. Now, key point, and something that Simon talked a great deal about yesterday. Evolution is indeed, as Stephen Jay Gould argued, inherently unpredictable in detail. Gould's metaphor is that if we rewind the tape of life back to the Cambrian and we let it run again, we are likely to get a different outcome. As a matter of detail, he's absolutely right about that. And I think Simon Conway Morris would agree. But as a matter of generality, I think he's wrong. And so does Conway Morris. Because what evolutionary processes do is they explore something that evolutionary theorists call adaptive space. Now, adaptive space is very difficult to visualize because it is multidimensional. Um, but what imag one man imagines in adaptive space is there's a certain style of living in which you make yourself green, photosynthetic, and extremely sexy. Um, that style of living is called being a tree. Uh, a tree, even in a moderately successful reproductive year, can produce as many as 10,000 offsprings. That's why I say trees are very sexy indeed. There's another style of life in which you make yourself small, impossible to, saw, uh, to find, and reproducing at astonishing rates. And that is exemplified by the bacterium that is sitting on the tip of the fingernails of each of you right now. That works as well. There's another place in adaptive space for large predatory animals swimming in the oceans. In this aspect of adaptive space, the laws of hydrodynamics require that you should be torpedo shaped, that you should have a fin in the back, whether it's horizontal or vertical, and that you should have stabilizer fins. That's simply the laws of hydrodynamics. Submarine designers follow those laws as well. And that's the reason why unrelated organisms like dolphins, ichthyosaurs, and sharks have this super, superficial similarity of convergence, which Simon Conway Morris talked about. These aspects of adaptive space produce 
a kind of evolutionary convergence, which has been championed by Conway Morris. And the reason is that evolution arrives at similar solutions, shapes, sizes, and styles of life for similar regions of adaptive space. So I would argue, and Simon certainly has argued brilliantly in print, that if one took Gould's experiment and wound the tape of life back to the Cambrian and let it run again, Gould is right. You're not going to get the same outcome. But you will see the same regions of adaptive space filled with the same kinds of organisms. They might not be mammals and reptiles and amphibians, but you would still see organisms that conform to the size and the shape and the style of life specified by natural selection in those regions of adaptive space. Now what that means, in a sense, is what I would call the evolutionary design of life is an inherent part of the fabric of the natural world. In other words, the capacity for evolution is in fact built into the planet and the natural world in which we live. Now, one often hears this word about chance or random evolution. And the notion that evolution is random is not at all the same as the scientific observation that evolution is in fact undirected. We cannot detect a direction or an order in which mutations appear or change occurs. But natural selection, which is really the key part of evolution, isn't random at all. And natural selection is driven by natural law. And it is natural selection in different regions of adaptive space that drives the evolutionary convergence that we see across all aspects of paleontology and natural history. Now, um, the necessity of all of this is that the filling of these evolutionary niches, these are these different regions of adaptive space. And I would argue, and so, so did Simon, including the emergence of sentient, self-aware organisms, that's what we are, allegedly, is directly driven by the physical constants of our universe. In other words, the capacity to evolve something like human beings. It doesn't have to be hairless, bipedal primates, but the capacity to evolve sentient, self-aware beings is built into the fabric, the physical constants of the universe. In other words, the emergence of the living world, very much like the one we inhabit, is not at all a random accident, but is an outcome that is made possible, one could argue about this, possible if not inevitable by the fabric of nature itself. And I like the slide that Simon showed yesterday in which he imagined visiting a planet other than Earth and coming across the scene on the beach where you have apparently a blue-eyed, blonde-haired Norwegian child playing in the surf and saying this would probably happen somewhere else. Well, I'm not sure about the Norwegian child and the surf, um, but I am sure about this general idea, which is this filling of niches in adaptive space is an inherent consequence of evolutionary laws and the playing out of the physical constants of our universe. In short, in a sense, one might say, the universe is such that we were meant to be here. Now, um, I actually talked about this issue with Steve Gould, who was a friend of mine, before he passed away. And Steve would say, you could never use evolution as the tool to fulfill the intent of a creator. Because if you wound the tape back, that comet that destroyed the dinosaurs might not hit. And instead of hairless bipedal primates, that would be us uh, occupying this niche, you might get big brain dinosaurs, or you might get large brain birds. And my answer to Steve was, how do we know that the designer or the creator wanted primates? He might have been very happy with bipedal big brain dinosaurs because the issue of us is not when, the, when scripture says that we are made in the image and likeness of God, that does not mean that God is a primate. The image and likeness is a spiritual one, and that spiritual one would apply as well to the kind of organism that today we call a bird or the kind of organism that today we call a reptile. It's not our mammalness that makes us special. It is our self-awareness, our ability to reason, and our sentient powers that make us special. Now, let's get back to the question that was considered in the preceding lecture. Does this mean that evolution, if, for example, it can explain the tendencies of the human brain to accept, and some would say to invent religion, thereby invalidates religious belief itself as a mere artifact of natural selection? And that, of course, was the topic of the talk that you heard previously. Well, um, there's a very interesting article that was written in the US in the New York Times Sunday Magazine called Why Do We Believe? Actually, the title of the article was Darwin's God. When I first saw that, I thought I was going to sue for plagiarism. 
in the title of my own book. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a very interesting article, and it is still freely available over the web, anywhere in the world, if you go to the New York Times website and you type in this title. And at first, I thought I was not going to appreciate the article. And the reason for that, you can see the subtitle. In the world of evolutionary biology, the question is not whether God exists, but rather why we believe in him. Is belief a helpful adaptation or an evolutionary accident? In other words, I assume the article will take it for granted that there is no God and simply would puzzle over the question, uh, as you heard formulated previously, is why people are so foolish as to believe in God. Well, it turned out it was a little more sophisticated than I expected. Um, and the article, in fact, handled this in a very interesting way. What is the better biological explanation for belief? Is it an evolutionary adaptation or is it a neurological accident? Is there something about the way our brain works that makes us receptive to belief in a supernatural? And he, here, for me, this is the key question. If scientists are able to explain God, what then? Is explaining the religion, is explaining religion the same thing as explaining it away? And that's really a key question. In short, are we hardwired to believe in God? And if we are, how and why did that happen? Now, towards the end of the article, I thought there was an extraordinary uh, series of quotations and discussions by the, art, by the author. And the author in particular pointed out Justin Barrett at Oxford, whose name you heard mentioned in the last talk as well, and pointed out that one prominent member of the byproduct camp, this is the camp that argues that the capacity for religious faith is actually a byproduct of the natural selection that produce our species, is Justin Barrett. And Barrett, paradoxically, according to the author, is an observant Christian who believes in an all-knowing, all-powerful God who birthed the universe into existence. And he wrote to the author by email and said, I believe that the purpose for people is to love God and love one another. Now, the author then wrote, this seems confusing. How does his view of God as a byproduct of our mental architecture coexist with his Christianity? Why doesn't the byproduct theory turn him into a skeptic? And then Barrett wrote, and I rather like this, Christian theology teaches that people were crafted by God to be in a loving relationship with him and with other people. Why wouldn't God then design us in such a way as to find belief in a divinity quite natural? And I think that's a key point for anyone who is a theist. And then he goes on, and since my wife and I celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary just a few months ago, boy did this hit home, um, having a scientific explanation for mental phenomena does not mean we should stop believing in them. Suppose science produces a convincing account for why I think my wife loves me. Should I then stop believing that she actually does? Um, and I think that is very much akin to questions about religion. So these ultimate questions of whether or not evolutionary biology can explain the capacity for religious faith, which clearly is universal in our species, fall, in my opinion, very far short of being anything that invalidates that belief. And a simple way of putting that is that if you find it acceptable scientifically and theologically that a creator would have used evolution to fashion our bodies, why would it be so surprising that he would used, have used evolution to fashion our minds from which religious belief grows? And I think that's a very powerful question to put to skeptics. I would say the key question for all of us is whether science carries us as deeply into the mystery of life as we truly wish to go. Um, and I would also argue that people of faith of all denominations would argue that it does not, that science does not answer every question that is worth answering. Now saying that is not a rejection of science. I'm a scientist. I've spent my life working in science and God willing I will spend the rest of my life working in science. I'm not about to reject science. But being a scientist and being committed to that passionately is not the same thing as thinking that there are no questions that science cannot approach. I think there are many. This is not a rejection of science, but simply a recognition of its limitations. And I think that an understanding of the validity of this choice, you don't have to agree with it, just that this is a point upon which reasonable people can differ, is the first step to making peace between science and religion, a peace which I think is very much to be desired, certainly in my country, and I would argue certainly in Europe and other parts of the world as well. Now, um, one often says, well, okay, that's fine, but uh, I don't understand God that way. And for Christians and for Jews, I turn to our scripture and say, wait a minute now. The, the, the Abrahamic conception of God is a God who makes all things new. He renews the face of the earth. I don't think this is a God who would have imprinted 
this sort of static and inflexible order into the living world, made it one way, unable to change. And he certainly is not one who could have created only in the sort of clumsy ways that we humans create. And my scriptural backup for that is from the book of Isaiah, which is one of my favorite books in scripture. And as you know, parts of Isaiah are a long and contentious dialogue between God and Isaiah. And at certain points, God has just had it with Isaiah, and he just lets him have it. And at this point, he says, look, buddy, look, Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than yours, and my thoughts are higher than yours. God is telling Isaiah, don't think that I'm operating on the same level as you are. I can do things in different ways, and I can think things in different ways. So those of us who try to look at the world and say, how would God have done it? Inevitably, we are thinking like human beings. And we have a very clear warning in Isaiah from the Lord, don't think that I am bound by your ways of thinking and your ways of doing. So again, the criticism that evolution isn't the way that you might think God would have done it, Isaiah has God telling us, don't assume that I have to act the way that you would prefer. Um, another person has said, that evolution really ought not to be used to draw anti-theological conclusions. That person, of course, was Charles Darwin. And in The Origin of Species, he anticipated this problem. He said, I see no good reason why the views given in this volume should shock anybody's feeling. He'd been corresponding with someone else, he said, and he's gradually learned to see that it is just as noble a conception of the deity to think that he created a few original forms capable of self-development, that's evolution, into other and needful forms, as to believe that he required fresh acts of creation to supply the voids caused by the actions of his laws. In other words, to keep creating new species every time one of his creatures went extinct due to the actions of natural law. Darwin was gravitated back and forth between being agnostic, being a theist, and simply being confused. He struggled greatly with the question of religion, but he never ever allowed his ideas to be used directly in opposition to religion something that all too few people today appreciate about Charles Darwin. Now, does this mean that I am arguing, as a person of faith or as a Christian, that the Bible should be used as a scientific textbook? And if you heard me talk yesterday, you know the answer is, of course not. But I want to let you know, I'm not the first person to say that either. This is from St. Augustine, written in 411 AD. Augustine, one of the earliest and most influential of all the Christian writers, from a book of his known as On the Literal Meaning of Genesis. And we'll hear about Genesis, of course, later today. But I absolutely love this admonition from Augustine. And, and you can read this yourself. But what, as you read it, I'm going to translate it into what I think is 21st century English mm -hmm. to get the sense of it. So you take a look and see if I get the translation right. Even a non-believer can study geology, astronomy, zoology, botany, and other scientific fields. And that non-believer can gain scientific knowledge from observation and experiment. Now, the worst thing that could happen would be for that non-believer to hear a person of faith presumably explaining the meaning of the Bible, talking nonsense on these scientific topics. And we have to do everything we can to prevent the embarrassment of skeptics showing scientific ignorance in a Christian and laughing it to scorn. So what Augustine was telling believers in the 4th century, he wasn't worried about evolution. What he was telling believers, sorry, in the 5th century was very clear. And that is, if you use scripture, sacred text, to make scientific statements about the earth, the heavens, or animals and plants, in other words, biology, and you're wrong, the non-believer will assume you are equally wrong about the really important message of scripture, which is the message of salvation. And therefore, we have to do everything we can to prevent Christians from doing it. Augustine also pointed out that there is a way to understand creation <coughs> that is profoundly different from what fundamentalist Christians would argue is necessary today. I always tell my fundamentalist brothers and sisters, read Augustine. Augustine wrote, the universe was brought into being in a less than fully formed state, but was gifted by the creator with the capacity to transform itself from unformed matter into a truly marvelous array of, structure, array of structure and life forms. Every cosmologist and every uh, evolutionary biologist I know would be happy with that quotation. But I have to tell you, when I talk to purely scientific audiences, 
they usually like what I have to say right up to the point where I read a psalm or I quote from Augustine. And then I can see them squirming a little bit. And they begin to wonder, you know, what kind of science would you get if you follow the admonitions of a weird 5th century North African mystic like Augustine? And I think that is a fair question. So I think it deserves a fair answer. And I want to show you what Augustinian science actually means. And I can think of no better example than taking a religious person who went into the priesthood in an order founded according to the teachings of St. Augustine. Now this guy who went in uh, was, was very religious, devoted his life, his life to his faith, and he did very well. He was highly regarded by his peers. In fact, he became the abbot of the Augustinian monastery of St. Thomas in Brunn, a very religious person. Now, at one point in his life, he got interested in what today we would identify as a scientific question. And that question was, how do plants pass their characteristics along from one generation to another? So how did he answer that question? Did he, uh, did he read scripture? Well, we know he did, because he had to read scripture every day for the Roman office. Did he pray? We know he prayed, because one of his duties was to lead his monastery in prayer. But when he wanted to answer the scientific question, he didn't look at scripture. He didn't rely only on prayer. He went out into 